Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about the biggest myths that programmers believe. So let's get into it. So the question in question here is literally, oh, pretty much, Fr Frederick, what are some myths that a lot of programmers believe to be true? And this, uh, this is a little bit tricky because uh, I'm not sure about myths or like there are certain things I suppose that are are definitely there there's certain oh, absolutely things that people believe to a certain point and I have a few things here that I can give as an example but uh, there's so much I mean every every field has something that where quite a lot of people believe that this is true and although it may not always be false for the most part it's not actually all that accurate so I would say the biggest myth that a lot of people believe is that uh, clever is better or that innovation is always something that is useful or that that trying to create solutions to problems that are as clever uh, or, or as uh, I don't really have a better word for it than clever because I don't really know how to define a like a person who tries to take a solution and tries to improve upon it even if that is not not, not strictly necessary. This is something that every almost every single programmer does. I mean and the proof is in the vast ecosystem of tools that we have today. If you look at the like uh, just insane amount of libraries and third party dependencies and like tools that are developed in like in different areas of programming it doesn't really matter which language, you will see how many people are almost constantly either reinventing the same thing over and over and over again, or they're producing things that have almost no value. Sometimes, absolutely, we, have, we see like true innovation taking place. There are some core tools that are developed that are truly important. And sometimes people that will make something that is less popular maybe, but you know, nonetheless valuable to certain people. I mean, Whoever wrote that SAS library, not the not the SAS like in CSS, but the SAS file format library that I used the other day, is I mean he was a gift from God or some program maybe from Linus Torvalds I don't know some person sent that guy my way because I would really have hated to implement my own version of that and I mean he even stated on his project that oh no you're probably never going to use this but I did actually have to use it because I was working with a really old file format so sometimes you know it doesn't have to be that a, a tool is popular it's more about people rewriting the same thing over and over and over and over recreating the same thing over and over and over and over and in some for some reason they believe that this is valuable then and I kind of feel like this is the I don't know if this is a necessary evil that this is the way that truly useful things are developed but I just don't see why we need let's say another SBA framework or another routing framework or another microservices framework I mean why there's no, they like I they, they keep on being produced with different selling points it almost feels like a marketplace where you in a very similar fashion to any other product in like any other industry it's like as I said in a few other videos, the shampoo industry. Everybody's promising the same thing. Everybody's saying the same, th uh, telling you that their their solution will solve all of these problems, right? And for somebody who isn't all that informed about the different, con different considerations that you need to make as a professional software developer, they will actually believe this. And what value are you actually producing? And this is the thing that I claim. I honestly to God, I honestly think that the main reason why these tools are being produced and promoted in this fashion is not necessarily because they're going to solve a problem for somebody else, but because the people who actually developed the tool just wants to produce this thing because it's enjoyable to them. They produce it for no real other reason than it's going to solve some problem that they perceive to be valuable and a lot of people just make it because they think it's fun, right? So 
all of this is noble. I mean, I really encourage people to kind of follow their passions and really produce things if they think, I mean, if it's a hobby or if it's something you do because you, you really enjoy it, then you should go for it. It's just that the, the problem isn't that the, you produce it necessarily. The problem is that on the other side of this conversation, you have a bunch of developers who, I mean, it's like, the, I just don't get it. I, I really don't. It's, uh, I've seen it happen a hundred times where people I know for a fact are really intelligent, critical thinking and really good at their job. It's like they see some shiny tool somewhere, something that doesn't really bring all that and it doesn't really make any difference to our workflow and they get excited about it and it's like it short circuits their brain. They stop thinking about what's good for their project and what's good for like their company and stuff like that and they just add it in and they just want to because they emotionally want to play with it. And this, the, the myth here is that this is a useful thing. It, it, it's not actually. One of the main reasons as to why a system rots to absolute shit is because of legacy and legacy gets produced when you don't have a clear way forward, when you, when you do these sorts of ad hoc decisions and you add things in without really thinking it through, without making sure that you know the impact of the decision that you are making. And I just don't see, I, I don't see a way of stopping it. I really don't. Like yesterday I saw the, I mean, this must have been a, a, a tool from hell in my world. There was a tool developed, for, in this case it was for JavaScript, my fr and one of my coworkers said that, oh yeah, I, this might be really relevant for us. And I sat there and I just, he sent me the documentation and it's literally a tool to create microservices for a front-end project. And the selling point of this tool is that you can configure a node server so that you can load multiple SBA frameworks to the same page. So you could in theory have one section of a page that is running Angular, one in Vue, or like one component in React, and you, know, you could combine them on the same page and still get them to be compiled and dispatched from a single network request, like to get that page. And I just sat there and I, I'm like, why? What possible use case could this have? And I mean, the argument was here, oh yeah, because you, you might have multiple frameworks or you might have different autonomous teams that need to use different things. And I mean, the big companies use this, so why won't we use it? And I just sat there and I'm like, well, but we are not Google. We're, we're not like, like a, there was a great tech talk where he said, th this guy said it better than anybody's ever said it before. So, because there was a time when microservices and all this stuff was about, uh, you, know, you know, one selling point of this was that you can use any language for any service you want. It's just that as soon as that motherfucker, that person said that on stage, when I saw, started hearing this, the first thought I had is like, yeah, it's gonna be fun for the company to have maybe 20 different languages. So, as, you know, because programming isn't complicated enough, but if you, do you have any idea how hard it would be to maintain a microservices ecosystem where every single team has a different language? How do you hire people in an efficient manner for such a vast ecosystem? And this guy explained that at, uh, according to him, at Google they have roughly seven different languages and some thousands and thousands of developers. And he said, that's a very good ratio for like a big company. On average, a big company has one language per 2000 developers. So that's what we're going for at his smaller, like very small firm, because he did actually address this exact thing. And I think that's a genius statement. If you want to be microservice oriented, you should have one language per 2000 developers. Perfect. And, and just, it just keeps on happening. I just, uh, it's and for it's uh, it's like it this uh, this part of the engineers or the programmers who do this. It's like somebody. Uh, it's I I can only imagine that it's a sales strategy or it's the most efficient one of the most efficient sales strategies I've ever seen, where all you have to do in order for somebody to adopt your tool is to make them feel like this is kind of clever or that this is like sort of useful or it's uh, you get them excited that's the thing like you get them excited about the tool if you can get them to that point they will just ignore logic they will ignore everything else and just kind of go for it because they have no self, a lot of them they don't have any self-control so i would say that this is the 
the myth here is probably that programmers are objective critical thinking people. I will say that they are just as human as everybody else. I would say that they are like honestly the I, I feel like mo a lot of people blame tooling. I, it's, it, let's explain my favorite example is in JavaScript. There's so many people who blame JavaScript for shitty code bases and legacy and all I ever see is that this language seems to be just fine. It seems to be doing everything that it needs to be doing. The problem is the idiots to, that are applying all of these tools. It's literally the problem. I mean, I, I have, to this day, I haven't, I haven't talked to anybody who, who doesn't like JavaScript, who really like, dislikes JavaScript, who can just tell me that, oh, how, like, uh, it, can you identify with this? So whenever you had a problem in JavaScript, you just had this mindset that, oh yeah, no, the front end guy is gonna take care of it, or no, it's just front end, you know, or it's, uh, you know, it's just JavaScript, just, just, let's just hack it together. And I mean, if you have that mindset, who, what, wh where is the problem? Is the problem the language, or is it that you don't actually care enough to do this well? In the same fashion, how do you get to legacy? Well, you just allow a single individual. I had a coworker just yesterday told me the story that this one guy at his previous job, who was the front end person, had just decided to just arbitrarily add, uh, rewrite their, most of their code base in uh, CoffeeScript. He just decided that, yeah, we're gonna use CoffeeScript. And anybody who is working today knows that CoffeeScript has quite a lot lesser, lower relevancy than TypeScript or something like that. But that wasn't the problem. He, as he explained it, the problem was that when he quit, like uh, shortly thereafter, he uh, took all that domain knowledge with them because none of the backend developers had ever worked with CoffeeScript. They didn't understand anything. And I just sat there and I smiled and I said, let me guess, he could do that because nobody cared. Because I will bet you my left arm that if he had come and said to you, because this was a .NET developer, he said, hey, I'm going to rewrite this in Java. I'm going to rewrite our server in Java and started doing that. He would have gotten stopped immediately by every single backend developer at that company. And he, my coworker, he just started laughing. Yeah, that is absolutely true. Had he tried to do that on the server, we would have stopped him. But since he was on the front end, we just kind of let, you know, it's just front end, right? That's the problem. So what I want you to take away from this is basically that the big myth in uh, that programmers believe is that they somehow are, like that people are above this like being tricked in by sales strategies or being uh, indulging this uh, need they have of complicating things or just changing things for almost no objective value. That's the biggest problem you have with developers who are innovative because they're not always innovative. They're just changing things due to emotional reasons. So if you have problems with legacy and you have these sorts of like these sorts of issues, it's very likely tied into that you have these people who they don't have a strategy. They just try things out because they can. You know, they think it's fun or whatever. And honestly, the biggest myth as to why software developer software um, software pro or different systems fall to shit is not because necessarily because management is always making like a bad decision or something like that forces a programmer to just write really shitty code. Most of the time, it's because they contribute just as much as everybody else to creating this mess. And I just don't see a way to fixing this as, uh, apart from maturing developers at large. And I just, I don't know how to do this. I'm sorry. Have a great day.